Um, I knew who Bob Alford was before I met Bob, and, and we go back a very, very long way. I, I've known Bob over 30 years. And uh, I, I knew about him because, like a lot of the rock geeks who are in this room, you spend a lot of time reading the credits. Who wrote what article? Who took what photograph? Who produced this? You know, who was the art director? And growing up in Detroit, Cream Magazine was a very important part of my upbringing. So every month, you'd, I'd go down to the local drugstore, which carried magazines when people bought magazines. And I'd buy my issue of Cream, and I'd look through and read everything about every little band I could, whether it was Blue Oyster Cult or The Runaways or, or Led Zeppelin, whoever they're writing about. Because they, they covered so many different things than what Rolling Stone did or what you'd read about in the newspaper. And you'd see these you know, photo credits. And you know, Robert Matthew was one of them, and one was Robert Alford. And you'd see a photo of a show that you'd attended. You go, wow, I was there, OK. And then you'd go to the next show, and you'd see the guy taking the photographs. And then six weeks later, you'd see the photograph show up in Cream Magazine. And you go, oh, that must have been him. So later on, I actually got a chance to meet him and befriend him. And, and, and as I said, from low these 30 years, I've been friends with Robert Alford and always been an admirer of his work. And um, we've been working on putting this exhibit together, I, I guess, about four years we've been talking about it. To give you an idea how long does it take to develop exhibits here, the answer to that question is four years. Three licks to get to the center of a Tootsie Roll Tootsie Pop, four years for uh, an exhibit at the Rock Hall, sometimes. Uh, I want to start with this, this one image here, because uh, I'm sure most of you who are from here will remember. Uh, in the background, it's Cleveland Municipal Stadium, and Bob shot many shows, not just in Detroit, where he's based out of, but came down here many times. We'll be discussing that as well, and there's a number of other really cool images. Um, well, we'll actually, we'll get to that in a second. I want to, without any further ado, as they say here, I want to introduce to you Mr. Robert Alford. Adam Howard. Uh, nice to see you again. Good evening. Long time. Uh, <laughs> we've been talking, I don't know, every day just about, or at least three or four times a week for what, a year and a half about this? Something a year like or so? That, yeah. yeah. So we've been working on this a long time. So we've, been, we've known each other for 30 years, so this is going to be very, very hard for us to put this thing together. But um, when you first picked up a camera as a kid, you're, this was a hobby thing for you. Sure. And the first thing you shot was not music, because you didn't think about shooting music at the time, sure. but what, what was the first thing you really shot? Well, um, travel photography probably was the first thing, but the first thing that really kind of captivated me was uh, were cars. I was really interested in building models and looking at hot rod magazines and things and mm -hmm. going to the track, and I started shooting uh, feature car photography and drag racing and whatnot down at Detroit Dragway when I was probably 13 years old or so. I used to get dropped off. I'd find somebody. I'd have gas money. I'd find somebody that could drive me down there and drop me off yeah. if, you know, if my dad couldn't or whatever. But uh, you know, that was the first thing that really I actually made money at was doing automotive photography. And, and like every city, I, I, don't, I can't remember what Cleveland's Speedway was. Um, Thompson. Okay, Thompson. Dragway, Dragway 42, yeah. um, Thompson, um, Norwalk is a great track. Okay. Uh, Columbus had an NHRA track. So Ohio was actually a big drag racing state. So you made a point of, you checked well, out a lot of these places. And then, of course, Detroit Dragway. Sure, but there were a lot of drag Most racers and a lot of drag racers here in the big and state. And this is one of your first shots. Why don't you tell everybody about this? This story? was shot here in Ohio. This was shot at, uh, down in LaRue at, uh, at uh, the first AHRA event that they had there, mm -hmm. um, 1971. It was actually taken a, two weeks before Dickie Harrell actually died in a, in a crash. Oh, wow. And um, this is a fire burnout where the fuel that they're using to do a burnout in ignites. And uh, it was just an interesting photo, and it's been a good shot for me. It's been published quite a bit. Now, were you aware of what he was going to do at the time? How much staging no. in your mind took place for this? No, I was always shooting people when they were getting ready to do a burnout. And this was something that was spontaneous, and I was pre-focused for it. And I actually had a... Um, I had a 120 roll film camera. I had a pretty good camera. I had a Hasselblad. Um, my friends. That's, when a I was, pretty, that's a pretty impressive yeah, piece of equipment. Yeah. For when I, when I, uh, my friends were saved up money to buy motorcycles, and I bought a, I bought a <laughs> camera that was worth a motorcycle. So, you know, to say it didn't get me, you know, around uh, physically, but it got me places. Yeah. So I, I, one thing I love about the composition of the shot, not merely the flames, you can almost feel the heat no, coming out. No, it's the action of the fans. The people over on the left-hand side. Yeah, uh, they, were, they were rather blown away, uh, yeah. you know, to say the least. Yeah, the sheer volume of this, right? right. Um, uh, just parenthetically, Dickie Harrell, the name of this driver, is also the name of the drummer for uh, Gene Vincent the Blue Caps, who was inducted. Right. Right. No relation, obviously, right. Dickie. Right. You know, the, other, the drummer's still with us. Right. Right. In fact, attended the uh, induction ceremony this year. Uh, how, how long, I mean, how long did you shoot drag racing? I shot drag racing from 67, 68 through 
through 73 actually. I was, in, I was in California in the fall of 73 working doing drag racing photography when I got the first break in the first assignment to do rock and roll stuff. Now, you were actually you became a professional through this, right? Right. Okay. right. And what, the first photos I had published were in car mag were in hot red magazines prior to music, you know, publications. And actually this this is a, a wonderful one cuz this is actually kind of like a harbinger of what you would do later. Yep. Um, here we have the legendary Shir Shirley Cha Cha Muldowney, uh, the first female drag racer. Right. And this was taken at Dragway 42 in Ohio. Oh, wow. This was taken down south of here. She was the subject of, yeah. a, of a film called Heart Like a Wheel. Right, and this was when she first got into professional racing. And Connie Coletta, who's a very successful drag racer, Connie, helped her out. Connie, male Connie. Right. Female right. Connie. And it, this was an ex car of his. And all they did was repaint the panel, the yellow panel. And this was actually originally his funny car. And he kind of, she kind of inherited it. Was this something that you did for a magazine? Or was this, it, I mean, how did this come about where you actually had her pose for you? Well, you know, I was always into shooting candids. Uh, when I first went to my first NHRA drag race in 69, I was really uh, very interested in the drivers and the people themselves as personalities. And I started doing a lot of headshots and catching people working on cars and doing things. And, um, you know, it was just something they were interested in. Just like in rock and roll now, for people to see behind the scenes photos, mm -hmm. other than what they do on stage sure. or on the track or whatever, were interested in. You know. Did you find that those sold? Or were the magazines interested oh, in that sort of thing? Absolutely, yeah. And in this particular shot, it's interesting because of the way she's dressed and everything is very much, you know, the period. You know, not really that. I was suspect at the time that not really was it diff different for a woman to be driving a, a, a right. drag race. Right, well, very few. But a very you know, attractive, comely woman, yeah. you know, dressed, in, I don't want to say provocatively, but certainly not hiding anything in a right, way. Right. Um, I got to point out that the sponsor of the vehicle is not merely Fram, but Fredericks of Hollywood <laughs> is you know one of her sponsors, which I, I just pretty funny. Yeah. You notice over in the far the frame, there's a Schwinn bicycle, a Schwinn. Yeah. Pretty neat, a Stingray over there. Yeah. Is that I, yours? Or you no, but I, did, I had one similar to that yeah. when I was a kid. But it's kind of another neat thing that really shows the period of time. Yeah. But you you started moving towards shooting music, and then you had one. Well, you know, I went to concerts a lot, and I took cameras. And because of not having the access, you know, like we said about like the monkey show, that I realized that proximity to the stage made a lot of well, sense. Well, you and I discussed that. These folks haven't right. heard it, nor the people on the internet who are listening. But right. tell right. us about that. The first show you shot. I, I took show. a Kodak Instamatic camera to a monkeys concert at Olympia. It was a 20,000 seat venue, and I was about 100 feet away from the stage. And those little Instamatic cameras had somewhat of a wide angle lens so mm -hmm. that when you were at home at Christmas time and you're trying to get the family in around the Christmas tree and you're in a room that's only 12 foot deep or whatever, you know, it would allow you to do that. So in essence, the camera was making things further away than you actually were. So I, was, I got great photos of all the people in front of me, all their heads and their cameras and everything else, you know, and you could see a little light, you know. Is so off in the distance, yeah. there's this little illuminated square. I found the negatives. I told you I found the negatives going through. Seriously? Yeah, I found those negs uh, just a couple weeks ago and, you know, they're, they're useless, but they're neat because they're the first time I tried to shoot a concert. It was 1966. Oh, so you know? what was the first show you shot that you really got something good? I think. Well, that was, that was in 1970, um, Cobo Hall, uh, Sly and the Family Stone. And this, and is, this is a shot. Yeah. Th this is what you considered your first. Right. That's the first time I got stuff that was usable. Mm -hmm. And um, the audience rushed the stage, and I went with them, and I ended up real close to the stage, and I got up on a chair and, you know, got some pretty good shots. I was excited. Zoomed home and uh, had to process the film before I could go to sleep or anything. You know, I had yeah. to see what I got. That became kind of a regular practice of mine. Which, which is, goes to talk about the craft of what you were doing at the time, which is actual, it wasn't really hobbyist. There's a craft involved. There, there's a skill. There's some science. You're not dropping off uh, a roll of film. Right. We're not going to photo mat or anything. Right. Photo mat. Right, right. You're going home. You had to build a dark room. Right. You had my first dark room was in a little bathroom in my home, and then shortly mm -hmm. thereafter, I, you know, got a little more sophisticated and whatnot. But and an extra bedroom or something. Yeah. Like that. Well, I made a little wooden thing like to go over, like where the toilet was. You know, like a thing where I could put my enlarger, and I had to build all these little. You know, I had aluminum foil in the window to keep the light out, and you know, it was very sophisticated. <laughs> How did you learn all that stuff? I, through school, I started doing uh, newspaper and yearbook in high school, and um, I started working for the studio that was the studio that had the contract with our high school to do all the stuff for yearbook and all that. Was there so, a photo club at your high school? Not really, no. Were you, you, the, you were the yeah, photo club? Yeah, I was the photo club, yeah. yeah. So well, as you, you know, learn this, did you, I mean, so you have, you'd, you'd shoot, you'd expose your film, you'd create the mags. How much trial and error was there to get to the point where you felt that you had something like this shot? Well, you know, it was, um, it was really about having better equipment, better lenses, and access. 
Is yeah. what really, you know, really made the difference. But this wasn't, you weren't working the show. No, no, but, but, but by my being able to be closer to the subject. Sure. Because it's all about reflected light. You know, you've got mm -hmm. to get up to where you can get the light reflected off whatever it is and be able to focus on it and get, you know, good exposure and whatnot. And uh, it just, yeah, um, as far as, you know, the craft of photography goes, yeah, you have to, you know, get in the dark and load the rolls and, you know, you had to have your chemistry at proper temperature and everything. It was quite, quite different than... Uh, than today and today um so, so we'll be taking questions at the at the end so hope you don't mind um and by the way some of the the photos that we're showing are not actually in the exhibit how many people here actually took the time to walk through the gallery and saw the exhibit before it came in um if you have a chance if we wrap this up in time we're open at nine o'clock tonight you can go down to the uh, main exhibit hall and in the baker gallery this is where the uh, where bob's show is on exhibit uh, we'll be getting to more show shots just from the show but we're kind of going a little deep here i think right um when um, you you brought your camera to the show as just like you just bought like a ticket, any, you, right? Right. Anyone could take a camera then. You know, it's yeah. not like today. There's no contracts or anything. You know. <laughs> yeah, which is something that we we had been discussing, and there was an article actually, a letter written by Paul Natkin. Uh, Paul is a Chicago-based photographer who right. essentially wrote a, um, an, an op-ed piece, for lack of a better description, about how things have changed and. Before we start lamenting how it used to be, what was it like shooting shows when you were just a fan? I mean, did you, now you walk through a metal detector when you get into a show, and you know, they give you the once over, they pat you down. Well, there was nothing to it. I mean, like I said, anyone could take a camera then, really. And um, it got probably, it wasn't until the end of the 70s when, you know, when merch came on strong and when things changed, when it really got commercial, that people started realizing that, oh, you know, we have to be careful about who we allow to take photos and mm -hmm. because of people started doing things and it conflicted with, you know, bootleg merchandise started coming about and whatnot. Sure. So people were more careful about it and slowly it tightened up. Mm -hmm. And by the 80s, um, you know, you really it was tough to get approval to shoot, you know, and, mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, as the 80s went on, it got tougher and tougher and people got to the point where they'd only allow you to shoot a couple songs and mm -hmm. then they began having stipulations about what you could do with the photos and they wanted to see them first sure. and all kinds of things and it just got more and more and, difficult. Yeah, I mean, you, you don't, nowadays there's no freedom, I don't know, for those of you who go to shows, just something you probably don't notice is the photographers, if you're wondering when the band yeah. is coming on, watch for when the PR person walks the photographers in to the pit below the stage because then you have about five minutes before the band goes on and they'll get to shoot for two songs maybe. Yeah. And then they immediately hustled out, and then the rest of the show goes on. But that's kind of a cue. But the thing, guys the thing the about that is you're telling them to watch for the people coming to the front. It's not so much they come to the front anymore. Yeah. Now they're walked to the soundboard or to yeah. the side of the room or even the back of the room. Really? And they're given a really poor advantage spot to shoot. It's like they really don't want photographers to get that good of photos anymore. Yeah, and, and the key thing is now photographers have to sign contracts, sure. essentially surrendering all their sure. rights. Most of, most of the assignments now are just generally for dailies. Okay. You know, daily papers and they'll only trust that because they'll allow those photographers to shoot just for a review of that show the next day and the photographer doesn't own or can't use the photos beyond that. Which you know, is so. the, you know, the reason why we have a show of Bob's photos is because you own all your images. Right, right. Um, over the course of shooting, you, know, you, you went pro not long after this really, in terms of shooting rock and roll, you developed a lot of relationships with um, a number of bands, a number of whom are featured in, in the exhibit. Sure. And one group that you had a particularly strong relationship with, we're going to talk about three of them here, is ZZ Top. Sure. Uh, when did you first meet uh, the guys in ZZ Top? Met ZZ Top at the Michigan Palace in Detroit in uh, December 74, mm -hmm. uh, opening up for Mark Bolin and T-Rex. Which is kind of an odd pairing to begin, you know, yeah. ZZ Top Definitely. and T-Rex, not Definitely. your initial who was anybody else on that bill? Yeah, like Point Blank, which was another band managed by ZZ's management, and they okay. were kind of a package together, so they probably got booked there together. Was a, a, the F South Florida right. uh, rock band. Yeah. And you guys kind of just, over a short period of time, became pretty tight. And Billy and I were both interested in cars, uh -huh. and he was very interested in other bands. Uh -huh. And um, we became friends, really, because we were both kind of gearheads, and I had some old cars, and um, he liked to ask questions about other bands and things. People think that, um, you know, like rock bands are on the road and they open up with other bands or have other bands playing with them and whatnot, but it seems that rock artists themselves probably see other artists less yes. than a civilian would. Yes. So he'd have a lot of questions knowing that I'd worked with a lot of people and whatnot. He'd query me about, you know, what's this band like and what are these people like and different things and it was kind of fun. You know? What was the thing that he was most curious about that would have 
caught the average person by surprise, you wouldn't think Billy Gibbons would have been into. I mean, what was he asking about? He was very interested uh, when they were when they were fashioning themselves different, when they were changing their sound. Yeah. Um, you know, when he realized the Fairlight synthesizer and things. You know, like the news easy sound. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, he was very interested in bands like B fifty twos and just mm -hmm. a lot of new music bands. And um, he was trying to he was trying to stay in the groove. You know, he was trying to make music that would be acceptable with you know things had changed. Yeah. Let's, I want to bring up this image, which is one of the, the best ones in the show, and it's certainly a singular one. Um, there you go. Billy Gibbons, and uh, Back from the Moon. <laughs> this has a great backstory. Now, you, you and Billy obviously were close, and this is something you, he conceived and you guys executed. Yeah, yeah. We, just did, this, we just did this on our own. This how did this yeah. all come about? I was in Houston on ZZ Top Business, and we'd finished the business over a couple of days. We'd gone through some new photos for publicity and whatnot. And we were having lunch at a bar called the El Dorado Cafe in Houston. And we'd, we'd eaten and we were just sitting there and sitting there quite a while just talking and whatnot, going through a few bowls of chips and whatnot. And um, we were talking about, I said, you know, I need to do a Stars car with you. You know, I've been shooting Stars cars features yes. for Cream. Yeah. And um, he had some wacky cars. He didn't have any fancy cars then like he does now. And we were trying to figure out, like, you know, he had his mom's old Cadillac and all these different things he was driving. And he goes, man, he goes, I saw this really crazy thing down. You know, he's telling you, he found something, saw something in Mexico. And it was a horse-drawn automobile. And this is a Model A Ford that's been converted into a street taxi. Okay. And um, he was just telling me all about it and how crazy it was. And it had this back from the moon sign on it, you know. And he says, you just wouldn't believe how goofy this thing is, you know. And so... And, we just talk, and he finished telling me about it, and he just kind of looked at me and he goes, are you doing anything the next couple of days? And I thought, well, I've got to do, this was like on a Tuesday. And I said, well, I've got to, uh, I've got something going on on Saturday, I think, or whatever, I've got to be home by Saturday. He goes, well, you want to go on a little adventure? And I said, you know, let's go, you know. And so he called up, <laughs> the, man a few called up the manager and got a cash advance, and um, we went to the airport. We flew to San Antonio. We rented a car. We drove through about 200 miles of desert. There were no restaurants or anything. I remember... We stopped at a gas station that had loaves of white bread, and we bought some avocados from another little guy down the road that had a little fruit stand, and that was the only food available. And I'll have to admit that I love avocados and I love guacamole and stuff now, yeah. but at the time I wasn't crazy about it. And, Did you uh, even have any silverware? Like no, 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 but I want to tell you, on a, on a 95 degree day in Texas, yeah. high humidity with a slice of raw avocado <laughs> on a piece of white bread, and I ate a couple, he gobbled his down, and I ate a couple bites of mine acting kind of like, you know, this is okay, and I was hating it. And I remember throwing it out the window, and all these birds went at it instantly, you know, they were like, and remember we were going, we were on such a desolate road that we had to stop and honk the horn for buzzards to get off the road so we could drive through because they'd be eating on, you know, like on roadkill or something. But um, when we got to, um, we were headed to Piedras Negras, uh, which is on the other side of the Rio Grande from Eagle Pass, Texas. Okay. And um, we the got... Burgeoning megalopolis yeah, it is. Yeah, Eagle yeah, Pass, oh, it was, it was all... Cardboard box houses on the other side of the river. It was unbelievable. It was very it was sad. And, um, but we, uh, we rented a taxi. We left our rental car in the United States because I don't think we were yeah. supposed to take it out of the country. Yeah. And uh, we, we got in a taxi and we went over to the city and we drove around for about an hour and a half going real slow, kind of looking down the side streets. And sure enough, eventually we found the thing. And we uh, suited Billy up. We had a bag with this outfit in it. And we dressed him in this thing, and I got baby powder out, and I shot baby powder all over him to make him look dirty. So you actually you came prepared oh, yeah. to do this. Oh yeah, we were going for a photo session. Yeah, okay. We weren't sure we were going to find the thing, but we were ready to do something. We probably would have taken a picture of him somewhere else. So you find this thing, and you know, it's not just sitting there waiting to be shot. You right. guys had it like yeah, we had to hire him to go riding around and stuff and whatnot. So you had to hire the owner, you had to yeah. grease the guy. Yeah, we took a ride in the thing, and the poor horse, he was. He was a sad fellow, the horse was. He was shedding oh. and whatnot. We were getting a horse here in our faces that we were riding around and stuff. It was, it was interesting. A little bit of mange. But we found this interesting little herb shop place on the street. It was painted pink. And we found a little place where there weren't a lot of people around where we could do this shot. And we got him dressed up and we did it. And as I was putting the baking soda on him, I was blowing some baking soda or baby powder down the street a little. And it got into a little guy's taco stand. Upset him a little bit, yeah. And uh, Billy gave him a few dollars, and he was happy. And we continued on with our session. And needless to say, we got the shot. It became a Cream Stars car, and mm -hmm. we had a lot of fun. And as we were leaving the town, there was like a little guy sitting with like a little souvenir thing. It wasn't a shop; he was yeah. just a guy selling stuff. And he had these sombreros, the big sombreros. Was like, kind of like a gift shop. That yeah, you know, like, he wasn't even a gift shop. He was just a guy selling stuff. Okay. And um, these were hand woven big sombreros, and. Uh, 
said, you know, we should buy three of those. We'll use them for something one of these days, you yeah. know. And so we bought them. We took them back. We got back to Houston. You know, I flew home and processed the film and talked to Billy a few days later and told me he had good success. And um, about six weeks later, I got hired to do their next album cover, which was the Warner Brothers album, El Loco. And I just and, had a chance. Yeah, and there are the hats. And there are the aforementioned hats. Now this is now tell about how this this shot had its own story because this was not the intended. This was not what Warner Brothers wanted for their album cover at all. No, and um, they wanted a shot of them in western suits, looking like Wyatt Earp and all this stuff and everything. We did the session. We took about two hours, dressed them up and all this stuff, and did all these photos and whatnot. And um, just as we were through with the session. Billy like stopped everybody and said, "Oh, just a minute, we've got something else to do here." And so we pulled out the jumpsuits. And you and you and Billy were already in on it. Yeah, we okay. we conspired because we stopped in the town before we got. This was in Monahan's uh, White Sands near uh, White Sands, New Mexico, the far west side of Texas near Monahan State Park. And it was against the law to pull any foliage or weeds or touch anything living because there was nothing alive around there. Sure. So on the entrance to the park, there were some weeds that were sticking out by the poles and whatnot. And those are the weeds that I pulled there. Needless to say, the park ranger came while we were doing the photo session and checked us out, see what we were up to and everything. We were like, hey, what's happening? How are you doing? And he didn't know, you know, he didn't know where the weeds came from. Yeah. You know, I could have gotten a $500 fine if you would have known when I pulled them at the gate. <laughs> Scoff, but, but we stopped at a little town and I bought uh, burlap sacks, the gunny sacks, and we spray painted those. That was our, that was Billy and I's magic thing to make things look nasty. We'd get primer, gray primer, black primer, Hmm. baby powder, dirt, whatever we could get to rub on stuff and to paint on stuff to try to make. He was, he used to rent a car and he'd get, he'd immediately take the hubcaps off the car and do things to it to make it look like it was just a funky car so he'd feel comfortable like driving around. I mean, he'd literally pop the hubcaps off down to the steel wheels and, you know, just do something to deface it instantly, you know, but he was, in, he wanted things to be funky and raw and that was kind of his style. I, I could see how that would happen because yeah. you listen to music, he's yeah. all about the funky, yeah. Yeah. all yeah. about the raw. So and this guy up here that was the he was just our bus driver. He was the you know, he was the tour bus driver, he just happened to have a pistol under the seat. You know, and uh, yeah, yeah, it's all, it's all Welcome to Texas. Of, yeah. this all came about so fast and so unplanned, it was unbelievable, you know. And so when we got into the editing stage, we looked at all the photos of what they liked and everything and he Bill Hammond, the manager, picked out the shots that he liked, you know, and then Billy said, Oh, now we're gonna look at these and we flashed these up. Of course everybody, you know, cracked up laughing and everything and whatnot. And uh, by the end of the edit and whatnot, this ended up winning out over the, you know, over the prediction. This is for a cover of El Loco, right? El Loco, the yeah. crazy, yeah. yeah. Worked out well. Yep, yep. Worked out well. Um, another group that you had a really uh, good relationship with, a very fruitful relationship, was uh, Cheap Trick. And this is a shot that's in the exhibit. Um, the, um, the back from the moon shot is in the exhibit. The El Loco cover is not, but right. this one is. Um, how did you meet these guys? Met these guys. These guys were just a hard touring Midwest band for many years. Sure. Um, would play Second Chance in Ann Arbor two or three times a year. That's where I first met them. Um, actually, they opened up for Tom Petty uh, at the Royal Oak Music Theater a few days before I actually met them and first shot them. Uh, that was the first time I shot them, but on a Monday after that, um, Epic had arranged a session for me, and I went to Ann Arbor. I told you I went to the old Howard Johnson's motel oh, yeah. at oh, US, US 23, 23 in Washington. Washington. Yeah. 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 And uh, they were paired up in two different rooms, you know, so I had to go to two different rooms and gather them up, and we got on the bus, and we went downtown and did a session from the Power Center, sure. all the mirrored, really pretty building, the Power Center there. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, and so they were just, we had a lot in common, them being a Midwest band, and um, I saw them often, and did photos of them and got them photos a couple different times that they needed and whatnot, and we became friends and they began to entrust me to do things for them. Now this, this photo is from... Uh, this is the from the Flame. Okay. This is from the Flame tour when they came back. This is like their, their reincarnation. Yeah, because Tom Peterson, the original bass player, left, the yeah. top right, had, had left the group uh, and then came back. Came back. And They've you know, essentially right. been the same lineup since. Of course, right. Bunny's not playing with them anymore. Right, right. Bunny's retired now. Um, yes, as they say. It's unfortunate because the band just will never be the same without Bunny. Yeah. But uh, you also, I mean, rather quickly, in a two-year time, got very close with these guys. Absolutely. And, and had, uh, well, they, as you related to me, was one of the most uh, amazing experiences of your life. And that was going to Japan. the Japanese them. tour in yeah. 1979. Japan had been closed down for concerts for over a year because there had been someone crushed at a Queen concert. There was a stage rush and some little girl got run over or something. And so, so there's a fatality. The, gov the government came in and just did away with concerts. And Mr. Udo, who was the big promoter in Japan, mm -hmm. um, knew that Cheap Trick 
were really getting popular in Japan. They were very, they were a lot more popular in Japan than they were here. Sure. And there was a demand for them, and he wanted to bring them over because CBS, Sony, and Japan wanted them there. And he had to talk to the government. It took him quite a while to talk to the government, and you know, he had to promise them all kinds of stuff, mm -hmm. and that he'd be very careful about the show's extra security and everything. But he uh, talked him into letting Cheap Trick come back and reopen the market. Mm -hmm. So not only were they really into the band, but they were hungry for a concert. So these guys came over for three weeks and did shows all the way from uh, Sapporo in the north, you know, where the Olympics sure. were, all the way to the north of the continent, all the way to Kanazawa in the south, did every major industrial city. We were there for three weeks. Akia, Sapporo, all, you know, Kanazawa, all the different, you know, okay, all the streams. So I'll show you a Nagoya. few. Here's a few that are not in the show, and I want you to kind of give folks some background on them. Mm -hmm. This is at the Budokan show that you always hear on the I Want You to Want Me with yeah, all the screaming yeah. girls. The Cheap Trick of Budokan was a breakthrough record, which right. was an import. It was released in the United States, not it as It was never import. intended to be released here. Yeah, it was released import, here yeah. eventually because they had to, because yeah. there were so many import copies coming in. in Japan, yeah. U.S. CBS had to put it out yeah. to stop the, you know, they were making too much money selling bootlegs. They were selling, you know, getting close to selling 50,000 copies of the yeah. bootleg. It was at one point the most successful imported record right. in, in U.S. history. And then, this, but this is a shot, you turning around and catching the crowd, right? Right, oh, and these guys were funny. The security guys, the fans started getting more and more excited. Finally, they just kind of ran these guys over. But the one guy's getting his hat knocked off, and the other guy's like, you know, got a headache or something here, you know, but they were, they put those um, bicycle rack things, like you could park a bicycle sure. through. Sure. They put those all down the aisle about every 10 feet mm -hmm. so that people couldn't rush the stage again. They did all kinds of extra things to prevent there being something go wrong at these shows. And, and the, the, the crowds were particularly orderly, as I understand that even today in Japan, when, right. when an audience leaves, they leave in sections, right. very orderly manner. Right. And does that go back to... They're very, they're very polite people, but they get excited like anyone else. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, Budokan, is, um, I guess the Beatles were the first concert there in 66. Right. Uh, but it, Dylan did a famous show there, a few bands did. But it, it still holds a, a very special place in the hearts. It was, a, it was their it was uh, a, wrestling a, arena yeah, for and, the sumo wrestlers. And it's one. a very, you know, sacred place in a lot of ways. Um, but they have everything sacred shows. over there. Yeah, but, but they have rock and roll shows there. And right. of course you can see like looking at near hysteria right. with, with the crowd um, overwhelmingly. Female. It was interesting because the people that were closer seemed to be wealthier people too. I think these people had, you know, wealthy parents or something because these are people. Are you saying connections to get good seats? I, Even well, they were all dressed. I <laughs> just remember all the people that were dressed within 50 feet, of, you know, had, you know, nice clothing on and everything. You know, it was obvious it was an advantage. You know. Since you had a lot of time, you guys got out a bit. Uh, and um, I, I love this one, um, mm -hmm. which th this isn't one that ran in cream. This is a, a, a known yeah, photograph. Yeah. We were up at a park walking around one afternoon killing some time and I was taking around there were some shrines and things and I was trying to take some photos of them with things that looked like they were in Japan yeah you know you really so, got a mark in the yeah. spot so yeah we ran into these little guys they were baseball and, and this guy here to me looks like Mo of the Three Stooges yeah, you know, yeah. I like the buck teeth yeah, guy this kid over there. there he's great yeah, kid over there. Just, yeah. that you know kind of gawky, yeah. geeky smile hopefully you grew out of it but it was so cool because they saw Rick and they like all did that with their hats. We didn't ask them to do that. You know, they were like, "Oh, that's cool." You know, I mean, it was like, you know, I'm sure like it started something. You know, you know, but but they all did that. It was just, it was just very entirely weird. spontaneous. Yeah, it was cool. And then of course there's Tom Peterson looking so cool that you can't even calculate it. Yeah, you got to hate a guy. He had a lot of fun over there. Yeah. I'll bet he did. In fact, I have tons of photos at all the parties. Each night they were given gold records, and they have the big sake box you crack open and everybody you know get a box of sake to drink and whatnot yeah. and Tom had a good time on that whole tour and he was <laughs> drinking a little more than than he does now yeah. and he's not proud of that and he's like canned all these great photos that I've got from all through the tour of him you know passed out or you know having yeah. fun and different things and stuff I mean he's a great guy you know and I mean I respect him you know but at, at, so, at some point I guess that would get kind of old it was fun the ninth night in a row of having to knock yeah. back and then yeah. quarter sake um, yeah, I wasn't really a drinker either, and I had a little bit of that stuff, and it's, you know, I can see why it would, you know, make people do things. You know. um, this is also taken in Japan, right? Right. So, right. Robin was very interested in photography, mm -hmm. and that's where we bought him his first camera, and that's his first camera. And he used it for quite a few years. He got, had little kids after that and used it as his family camera. And he took it on the road with him about 10 years later, and it got stolen out of a hotel room. Mm -hmm. And he called me. He was very upset because it was a special Canon body that we had found in Japan. It was a black Canon AE-1 body that was very limited. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it took me about five years at camera shows to find him another one. But I replaced it with the exact same rare camera for him years later. So he was very pleased with that. But yeah, Robin was an avid photographer. He was supposed to do a photo session of me mm -hmm. a few months ago. We were supposed to have a meeting with John Barbados, and then it got canceled because of mm -hmm. Aerosmith 
sickness and whatnot. They were oh, opening okay. for Aerosmith. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they got they had to go in a different direction. Some shows were canceled, and so our meeting on July Tuesday, July twenty fourth, or whatever, was canceled, and we didn't get back together on it. But, but he says he'll still do it sometime. I, I have no doubt. Um, there's another one. Uh, yeah. Of yeah, that's when we bought his camera. That was us actually walking back to the hotel, and he's got his camera in his hand. He was taking pictures of stuff. You, you told me a story about at one point going through a crowd with with Robin. At Oh, yeah. We were going to a radio station, okay. and it was one of those Depeche Mode scenes in the streets like Tower Records where there was like a thousand people outside the radio station waiting for us. Mm -hmm. And the cars pulled up, and there wasn't even room for the cars, so like the police had to push the people away. We slowly creeped through the people and got up close enough to the doors, and then like four or five security people had to get around each one of them and kind of shelter them because the girls were grabbing at them, and yeah. it was pretty crazy. It was like, it was like the, the frenzy of the Beatles had going you know, in the 60s where people were just doing crazy things and grabbing and trying to rip their clothes and coming at them with scissors to get a lock of hair. In fact, Robin got poked in the back of the neck one time a little bit from some girl trying from to cut scissors? his hair. Really? And he had this really neat green blazer that he had bought in uh, Amsterdam about six months earlier, and he was wearing it. And um, these girls got a hold of him here, yeah. and other girls got a hold of him there, and they were pulling, pulling, pulling. Well, the jacket ripped right down the middle of his back, and it kind of disappeared into the crowd. And I was standing near him, and he looked over at me, and he goes, I like that jacket. <laughs> yeah. So, needless to say, how was it? You know, there's one thing about the fishbowl that you know it's 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 hard thing to get a good view on, and for them, I'm sure at times it was exhilarating and frightening. You were, you know, right at their wing for it. How was it for you? I mean, what well, you weren't the focus of the attention. Right. You were able to document it. Right. What was it like for you to be at that? You know, right next to the epicenter of something like that. It was very interesting because we didn't know what was going to happen, and there were a lot of instances where things really got dangerous because there were a lot of girls that were paying taxis you know I don't know what the deal was what they were giving them or what they were saying but they were telling them like you know follow those cars you know do whatever you have to do and these guys were running red lights and driving in the wrong lane of traffic and they had girls hanging out with cameras and going 60 miles an hour down the road and trying to get up next to our car to take pictures and it was really crazy we'd have to leave hotels through the kitchen through the back get in a truck and go drive two miles down the road and meet the limos and then go to the gig because the limos would go out and all the people would chase the limos. We'd send them off as a decoy. <laughs> wow. It was, it was really amazing. Never been like, with anything like that before. Have you seen anything like that since? Mm -mm. No. Mm. Um, it was a matter of timing. You know, it was just a, really a matter of timing. But the popularity, the fact that they hadn't had concerts, all the things combined just really, you know. Um, one of the things about being with those guys is you, I mean, you travel quite extensively with them and then there's these moments that people will never, ever see. Mm -hmm. And I, I love oh, yeah, this that's one. that's a good one. Um, on the uh, right there is Bon Scott of ACDC, the late singer of ACDC, <laughs> uh, Robin Zander, Bunny Carlos, and on the left is a gentleman named Peter Mensch, who at the time was... He was the road manager for ACDC. AC he's now the manager of Metallica. Yeah, manages, yeah. he's been meta managing Metallica yeah, since day one, and he also manages Red Hot Chili Peppers, very, very successful um, music business manager. And but what was going on here is he and Bunny had bet on Robin and Bon. And Bunny is about to win the money because Robin's about to sink the eight ball. You can see the, the jubilation on Bunny's. Yeah. And, 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 and Bon, even though he's losing, he's got a nice laugh he about it. He didn't care that. about anything. Yeah, I mean, and he, he didn't care. Great sense of style, though. Open shirt, yeah, yeah. Yeah. middle of the day, drinking a beer. Yeah. Well, he'd be, that was in Cologne. And like the next morning, you know, I'm, I'm eating cornflakes at 8 o'clock in the morning, you know, in time to get the bus to take off out of there with the, you know, the whole tour and whatnot. And he comes in and he's knocking salt and pepper shakers off the table at 8 o'clock in the morning, you know, kind of. Yeah. So he was, he was one of those guys that drank quite a bit. You know how your wallet wears your jean back pocket? Well, his was for a half pint. His, well, his jeans were worn for a half <laughs> in pint. In the shape of a half pint? Yeah, in the back pocket, yeah. <laughs> what do you do? He'd start drinking in the morning. He'd drink at about 4 in the afternoon. He'd pass out, have a little siesta, wake up about 6 o'clock and go again. Not no. bad life. Yeah. Unfortunately, he, he didn't work out. He passed away yes. uh, about six weeks after this. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That was the last. That was the last time he toured. They were, you know, putting together the album. Oh, know, they did the Back in Black album. So this is at the end of the Highway to Hell tour. Yeah, and they right, and they stripped. You know, they stripped his vocals cheap off. Cheap Trick uh, opening at this point. Cheap Trick were yeah. They were yeah. Bond. Uh, no, ACDC were opening for them. Really? Oh yeah. Wow. Yeah. That, See, ACDC was... weren't really big until that Back until in Black, Black album. Black, yeah. yeah, after he died. But Highway to Hell certainly was Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, in fact, what, was, what the package was, it was Molly Hatchet, and then ACDC, and then Cheap Trick and The Who. The Who were back for the first time since Keith Moon had died. They had oh, Kenny okay. Jones drumming with them, and yeah. the big Nuremberg show was like the big Who comeback. I and see. So these bands were, yeah, they were over there. And they played Reading Festival, uh, Open Air in Belgium, the Nuremberg Festival in Germany, all the big fall festivals. So when you... 
you would cover these shows. Would you just shoot Cheap Trick, or would you make a no, point I'd of... No, I'd shoot everybody I could. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd be there on one guy's dime, but I'd shoot everybody, you know, I mean, everybody I could. <laughs> yeah, you know? well, right? Yeah, right. Um, but the one thing that you were shooting, and this is something that a lot of people don't necessarily consider, you were actually shooting on film. Right. Oh. This is not digital, right. where, you know, you take an SD card. You be careful about what you were doing. You, yeah, know, you didn't I mean, have to just let it fly like a machine gun like people do now. You know? Yeah, and you could just, now you sit there and yeah, knock off. Yeah. It's almost like a movie. Yeah, you can but, send a monkey out there and have him shoot 300 photos, and he's going to get two or three good ones, you know, so. Just odds are. Yeah, by accident. How many, how many rolls of film would you take with you to an average? Uh, uh, four to six rolls. I, would uh, drive. I was shooting of slide film. Okay. You, all, you never shot print film? Well, or rarely? Everyone shot negative film. It was more accessible. But publications wanted slide film because of the way that they laser scanned, the way they had to do color separations for four color printing. Mm -hmm. The slide was more accessible, more adaptable. The way the light passed through it, you got better color saturation. So all professional magazines that you saw in the 60s and 70s, the majority, probably 90% of the photos that were taken by professionals for publishing were transparencies. Now, you obviously were paying your own way. I mean, you were buying your own film. No one was giving you film. Right. Well, I got assigned. I, you know, there were times when I was working for people, but I was shooting everybody that was touring all the time. Okay. So I had to make up the difference. Yeah, and you had to keep a stock of sure, film, right? Sure, sure. I mean, when you, I mean, you take, say, four rolls of what, 24, 36? 36, you know, okay. I'm trying to have 36 rolls. How much would that cost you a night? Well, it was like 20 or $25 a night, which is no. probably the equivalent of, you know, 75 or $100 today. So you and this was going on, night. yeah, it was tough coming up with, you know, coming up with film all the time. And you were shooting every night of the week pretty much. A lot of times. Yeah. Sometimes I'd shoot two shows. You know, I'd shoot Billy Joel at one venue and run over and shoot the Eurythmics somewhere I, else. I or, remember that. that or or, uh, right or you know, uh, the Blues Brothers, you know, at uh, Pine Knob and then Chuck Berry at Meadowbrook on the same night or something. You know, just, you did what, you know, depending on how far they were away. I mean, mm -hmm. obviously, you knew you couldn't physically get to them. Two shows. That, of those four, I was at two of those shows. Yeah. <laughs> you were at all four. Right. Um, there, there's a lot of the photographs in this exhibit that I was at, I was actually, I think there's 38 images. I was at 21 of the shows or something like that. Wow. Um, the, the um, it goes to the point of you, you really had to take your time. You Absolutely. had to think about what you're well, shooting. Well, you had more time. You got to shoot the whole show, so we were able to, you know, you were able to use your craft in the sense that you could select lenses. You could, um, you know, you could shoot to get the fish eye lens out and shoot a full production shot of the stage and get all the lighting. And then, then the drummer would go into a, a drum solo, so you could get out the 200 and try to sh shots of him in between the cymbals. Mm -hmm. You know, then the lead guitarist would come out and climb up on the amps and do a lead. You know, you just constantly, you were able to use different lenses, you were able to compose, you were able to think about what you were doing. Did you ever see a, a band, well, obviously with Cheap Trick or, mm -hmm. or you, ZZ, you'd see them several nights in a row. Would you make a point of like, all right, tonight I'm going to set it back over here, or I'm going to set it over here. I want to get that part of the show from this angle. You know, you would do that only if you could shoot bands multiple nights because if you were only shooting them one night, you only had access or you're only in the pit, yeah. you couldn't do as much. But with the ones that you had, the, the recurring Absolutely. Shows, and right? like I mentioned to you about, um, I was really glad that when I came here to Cleveland on the 77 Zeppelin tour that I chose to shoot photos from further back from the stage. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up getting some very unique shots that other photographers didn't get because everybody was always shooting in the pit. So everybody yeah. was always shooting up Robert Plant's nose or just shooting shots of Jimmy Page by himself. I got great shots of the whole stage, the whole band, a true shot of Led Zeppelin. Yeah. And it became a very popular shot. I sold him quite a few places because yeah. simply because I had a different angle. And I, that famous, um, the uh, unplugged shot. The one of them all well, sitting there Evermore playing and acoustic. Yeah, I, you know, that one was in the first Zeppelin box set. Yeah, there's, uh, Bob, there's quite a few images in the, the first Led Zeppelin box set was the four CD thing before they did 1990. the... 1990. The reissue and stuff. Yeah. Um, another artist with, with whom you had a, a, a good relationship in the shop many times was John Mellencamp, oh. John, Johnny Cougar back in the day. Yeah, yeah. And you got to love the medallion with the uh, unicorn on it. The scrimshaw unicorn. Yeah, yeah the scrimshaw unicorn. You just, you don't get too many of those nowadays. Right? <laughs> and, so I, I, I miss and he it. had the old retro jacket on too. That was an old 50s jacket that he bought at a thrift store. That so you and you actually spent a lot of time with John and I did I had an uncle that was from Bloomington Indiana and the family had gone down there to see him several times and um, in fact the Alfords uh, Steve Alford was a famous 
basketball player. Mm-hmm. He's a cousin of mine, and okay. he's a coach now, I guess, or whatever. But he was from the University of Indiana. This is at Bloomington. Yeah. Well, John lived right down the road from Bloomington in Seymour. Yeah. Actually, in between there, in a little, it actually wasn't even a town. It was Belmont, a little stop in the road where there's like a, a little bait shop and a gas station and a few little things. And he bought a house there, and he turned it into a studio, and he calls his studio Belmont Mall. Yeah, the Belmont Mall. And it's yeah. a joke because there's nothing in Belmont, but he called, you know. So his his studio was probably the most you know the most. Specific. I mean, he recorded there. REM recorded there. A lot of people, uh, a lot of yeah. people recorded there. Right, but, right. But um, you you spent a lot of time with him. Actually, caught some very interesting things. Like uh, yeah, this is the studio. Yeah, this is recording the Scarecrow album in '85, which is maybe maybe his finest record. Yeah. Um, so is this a rehearsal, or they're actually tracking at this time? Yeah, they're they're, actually, they're they're tracking. Yeah, they were tracking. They were playing. In fact, he did a lot of live. Where a lot, you know, a lot of people single, you know, they do drum tracks and they do rhythm tracks or something, yeah. and then they come on and they layer guitar and vocals and everything. He did a lot of stuff. Live. He tried to keep it all alive in the room. A lot of spontaneous stuff. Yeah. And I mean, you you get close to these guys and you get some very unique ones. Um, who's this with John? That's his mom. That's uh, it's Mrs. Mellencamp. Yeah, they got the same nose. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this was, was this one ever published? Uh, Rolling Stone had me go and shoot this shot for a little article on him. Um, this particular one wasn't. And this was what they kind of asked for. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I went down to Market Square Arena just to take pictures of him with his mom and family and stuff. He didn't, I guess his, um, I don't know if his folks didn't make it to shows a lot. It's really funny because there's a lot of artists that like, you know, parents didn't come to shows, you know, until 10 or 15 years into their careers and stuff and everything. Iggy Pop, for instance, you know, sure, yeah, like, yeah. you know, things like that. But I think that, I don't know exactly what the situation was, but his mom was going to be at this particular show and they wanted me to come and get yeah, it. Yeah, funny thing you mentioned about Iggy, I don't think his parents had showed up to shows until the 80s. Right, right. And they were, right. They were right at the very end, his dad finally came to a show. Yeah, which was, had to be... He wasn't real proud of his son, you know what I'm saying? Uh, but eventually, I think he, he came around. Yeah, on absolutely, that, um, absolutely. Yeah, when, when Iggy finally right, cleaned right. himself up. But, but we digress. Um, this, is, this is maybe one of your best-known shots. It was a cover of Cream. From 1983. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that so was a time of synchronicity, and they were really they were they were the biggest band in the world at yeah. the time. How much time? And this is also kind of indicative of the weird dynamic of the the job. How much time did you have to shoot them? How much time did you actually have with them? I had about them? about two minutes to do this session before they were going to step on stage, and that was a great time to shoot people because they were in their stage clothes. They were. They were all psyched and ready to go. It was a good time to get them, you know, because yeah. they were usually very enthusiastic and they knew that I was there to take a photo to enhance their career in some way, you know. Yeah. So I usually had pretty good cooperation with people. The the, the interesting backstory about this shot, this was shot at Joe Lewis Arena. Right. Uh, summer of 83. Yeah, July 30th, uh, first of two nights. Yep. David Bowie had been there the two nights previous. Mm-hmm. And I'd been down there four nights in a row, two nights for David Bowie and two nights for them. Did you get good parking? I mean, were they yeah, well, no, yeah, I parked right I parked right where all the hockey players played. I was okay. really I, I just give the guy I gave the guy magazines and stuff, you know, whatever, and I knew the guy real well. Yeah. And there was a little place right next to Joe Lewis, a little private parking sure. area where all the Red Wings parked and everything. Right. And I just drive right in there, and I got to where I was so. They never, I got, they never let me park there. I, I got so I never. got so heady, and I got so in with this guy that I'd even have two or three people that were friends of mine. I'd say, drive close and stay right behind me, and I'd like come in and I'd bring them in with me too. You know, I was very daring at the time. You, you, you know, know, yeah. you had some weight. Yeah, yeah. Um, and in fact, the the circle drive that you go up to sure. the parking that you go around to Joe Lewis, mm-hmm. everybody would get in a single line, and there would always be room for another car to go around, but it was only single file into the parking lot. So I knew that you could just drive right around everybody. <laughs> everybody was thinking, like, what's this guy doing? And I just drive right around and go past, you know. There's, there's you have to do it 25 times, you know, you got it down. Um, the, the, you said you had two minutes to do this. Yeah. Um, the weird thing about this little backstory is the police had done two nights, um, and in between the two shows, they broke up. Um, there, was right. a, there was a show, a day off and a show. Right. And um, they broke up. The excuse was that Sting had screamed his voice out at a Detroit Tigers baseball game, but in fact, Stewart and... and uh, Sting had this massive blowout, yeah, and Sting, fight. yeah, and the manager had to come in to patch everything up because there were literally millions of dollars on the line. And, oh yeah, they and it, this is you know you can see how happy they are to be standing next to each other. <laughs> uh, but I, I thought you got a remarkable, remarkable shot. Now you and Andy, however, had a we had were a, buddies too through photography. Yeah, yeah, and Andy's actually had a sideline career. He's had a lot of shows, and he's published a couple books and things and whatnot. And he's he's known as he's one of the rock guys that's known as a photographer. Yeah, now tell us about. We, uh, this, that this day, um, they were staying at the Hyatt Regency, and um, he called me up. My studio was at uh, Metro Airport, and I was living there. And he called me up and said, hey, you know, what are you doing? You know, I got the day off and whatnot. And he goes, you take me to that camera place you were telling me about? And so we, um, he had the limo come and 
picked me up and he was in it. We drove over the east side of Detroit, Mack Avenue and 8 Mile to Classic Camera. Mm -hmm. Sam Binner owned the shop and he um, let, let us go through everything. Let us pick through all the boxes of stuff that wasn't out on the floor and whatnot. Oh, his stash. And, sure. and Andy found this very interesting Zeiss Icon camera, plastic body camera with a really neat flash a really good lens and he was just he just loved it he was just so excited to find this thing sam gave him a good deal on it and um he just all the rest of the day he just wouldn't let the thing go okay. and i did a publicity session for him for his book uh throb and this was the publicity photo and if you go to andy summer's website today and you click on photography this is still after all these years this is his favorite photo and this is the this is the home page of his photography site it's a, it's a great shot yeah. that's a great shot um I want to take you through a number of the photos that are in the exhibit, for those of you who haven't seen it. Um, one of the things that appealed to me a lot about your photography um, was, you know, part of it was the fact that it had appeared in magazines and I had some sort of emotional connection to it. But it wasn't all microphones in someone's face. There's a lot of, you had the opportunity to actually take people off the stage right, work with them, and yeah. work with them. There's a few live shots in the, in the show and I want to talk about a couple of them. Uh, this is Brian Setzer and Slim Jim Phantom of the Stray Cats. Pine Knob, 1983. Three. 1983. Um, and the connection that they had to another band and how you became friends with these guys, which kind of, I want you to mention that. How did in you 1976, Yes was the first band that actually hired me to work for them and travel with them. And um, they were managed by Sun Artists Limited, which was the last management firm for the Beatles and after Epstein. And um, they, uh, I worked for them for, oh, a couple years and they kind of went on hiatus. Well, Alex Scott, who was there, was Yes's road manager, called me up in, um, oh, I guess it was the end of 79. I said, well, I'm working with these new guys in England, and Dave Edmonds is producing, was a friend of mine, mm -hmm. and uh, said, we're going to be coming to the States, and we want you to take some pictures and whatnot. And so it opened the door, and I was like, really the one that did the, all the first Stray Cat stuff and did a lot of work with them and whatnot. Well, 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 remarkable, there was a stuff. connection between you know, two bands you never think of in the same breath. There's Yes <laughs> yeah. and the Stray Cats. Well, it was, it was through the guy that was working sure. for them. It wasn't any, you know, their music had no parallel or anything. But still, there, there was a connection. Oh, yeah, well, that, worked, that happened over and over again. Is I, because the guys that were good in this business mm -hmm. would go from band to band. Yep. You know, like Bruce Patron would be out with the Go-Go's, and then six months later, I'd see him working for NXS. Or, you know, if you were good, you know, sure. and tours only lasted so long. And some bands would put guys, you know, some guys would literally would pay people not to work for other people oh, yeah. so they would be available for them again. Yeah, my retainer. Um, but, uh, you know, generally speaking, everybody just kept working for somebody. Cool. Um, Thin Lizzy and Philip Leonard. Um, uh, what can you say about this one? This oh, he was just he was just a powerful performer, mm -hmm. just super powerful. It's funny because they were the band that ACDC really opened up for, mm -hmm. and um, they were very similar. But these guys were even more powerful than them at the time. You know, I mean, they just you know. Uh, they just had really good players, you know, and Scott Gorham, and they, heck, they had, uh, you know, and Brian Downey, and yeah. they were excellent. And, and they had a twin guitar attack, with, who was it? It was Gary Moore, Gary and, Moore and Brian Robertson were playing right, together, right. which is pretty sick. I mean, Gary Moore is no, no slouch, right? Uh, but to have them play together yeah, in the same band. And, and Phil, I think this band doesn't get enough respect, and uh, certainly, I, I believe, actually, when Metallica was inducted, James Hetfield said from the podium, it's, you know, they, 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 should, were be inducted, the they should be inducted, and uh, I'm not even exactly going to argue with James Hetfield, he's a big guy. Prince. Um, Prince was big in Detroit before he was big. In Very big. The, yeah, any place yeah. else. Um, but he's not a guy you generally get access to. He didn't really give access to anyone. In fact, when he was on Dick Clark's show and Dick Clark asked him some questions, he kind of stood there mute. It was yeah. very kind of disrespectful. I mean, mm -hmm. nobody treated Dick Clark that way, but he did. Yeah. You know, he could. You know, mm -hmm. so. Um, how many times have you? shot this guy. Oh, many times. In fact, he did a whole week of shows during the Purple Rain tour almost. He did like four nights or five nights at, you know, I shot all of them. But I shot him many, many times all through the different incarnations. Shot him first during the Dirty Minds tour, I think. And uh, yeah, he was, a, he was a great performer, no doubt about it. The guy really had a lot going on. And he's a great guitarist. People don't know that about him, but yeah, he's a really good guitar guitarist, better than a lot of guys. Uh, the Wilson sisters, Ann and Nancy. And uh, I, I, this is the you know thank you good night part right, of the show. Right. Um, so I guess again this is you got to wait for this one. Yeah. As a photographer yeah. That's the thing. See, when you only had so many rolls of film, you had to be careful to gauge 
sure. how much you shot. You well, know, you'd, it'd we, be really bad if you'd run out before something good happened. This is not a heart show. Heart was the middle of the bill. Right, it was ELO. Electric Light Orchestra was the headliner, and this was at Pontiac Silverdome. This was the famous show that yeah. they got caught with tape machines rolling. They got caught lip syncing. The Electric Light Orchestra was caught lip syncing and actually was sued. And they asked for it. They asked for more money than anybody had ever asked for, kind of at the time to do this show, mm -hmm. and that's why the lawsuit was such a big deal because it was like, you made us pay more than we've ever paid for food, and you know this was frozen, you know, kind of a thing, you yeah. know. So uh, it was just, yeah, that's why it was so, you know, Brass Ring were really pissed about it. You know, yeah, and, uh, they and paid them like a million bucks. Yeah, ELO e e e lost the suit, but it was pretty obvious when you know the cello players were running around the stage playing the cellos. It's not exactly known. For, yeah, it's not like picking up a guitar. Yeah, they didn't have knotty wireless units back then. You, <laughs> no, know, they, you had to have a cord plugged in. You exactly. Know? So it was, it was yellow uh, um, heart and, um, geez, who was the other one? Uh, Trickster? I Trickster. Think Trickster was Trickster. So you had to like, yeah. you know, measure out yeah. your shots for Trickster, Heart, yeah. and, and ELO. Yeah. Uh, so, but I, I remember things well, but Howard really remembers things well. well I was at Howard has this job. Uh, again, one, another one of the shows yeah. I was actually at. <laughs> and paid, paid tickets, tickets for. I went to that one with my uh, oldest friend, Mike Levin. Um, Iggy, back, back, back to the studio shots. Um, the great James Osterberg. Uh, this is not from the original run of Cream. This, this is. From no, this was own. taken when Cream got back together for a short period of time. Published by a firm in New York, they were mm -hmm. around for, I think, five or six issues. Sure. And this was an issue that they were doing, kind of commemorating, X Cream stories, past Cream stories, and whatnot. And this was like a lead shot that we took that uh, looked quite a bit like a session that Andy Kent had done in, in 1973. And it was kind of ironic because at this time, records were, you know, very unfashionable. Mm -hmm. You know, they're cool again now. But yes. at this particular time, people had convinced everyone that they were bad. So. Yeah, so yeah, this was, what you said, 93. So, you know, CDs, had taken, right. vinyl was very hard to find. Right. Cassette singles. Well, people didn't happening. care about vinyl then, you know. I, I didn't care that much either. I mean, we were, it was easy for us to bust them. You so, know. yeah, was this stuff that you had at your store? Yeah, it was just some extra stuff that took down, tried to get some different labels and whatnot. Yeah. Was he easy to work with? Was oh, yeah, he was. Yeah, I've dealt with him for a long time. You know, he's an old Ypsilanti guy. Mm -hmm. But he's, yeah, he's pretty cooperative. If he knows you're doing something, you know, whatever, he, he'll work with you. He was very cooperative with us. Lita Ford. And there's so much about this photograph that, that, that I love, whether it's her hair, <laughs> the look on her face, the, 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 the exactitude of how that shirt was, was cut around the <laughs> screen of the, the, uh, the, the um, spider web, her Black Widow guitar logo on the guitar, the, 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 the fact that the guitar is a spider. Um, you, you and Lita, actually, this is, this is when she was a solo act. Right, that was, that was quite a bit later on. I met the Runaways in 1976, the first time they left California. They were young girls, they were 16 years old, yeah. and they came to Grand Rapids to a festival. Uh, the festival was Spirit in Savoy Brown, and they opened up. Which it seems like, again, the, the wild bills that would happen back right. in those days where right. you know, Savoy Brown, Rock and Boogie bands. Totally were, unmatched they, bands all yeah. the time. Bands that didn't go together at all. Yeah, and were you sent to just cover the show or specifically the Runaways or how did they? Come I went out? Mercury, um, a fellow by, uh, what was his name? Sut Matter, the Mercury guy. I don't remember his first name, but the fellow from Mercury here in Detroit was going over to greet them sure. as a representative. They were on Mercury, their first album was, and he went over as their label representative, sure. and he had me come over and do shots. And we took them to um, we took them to a playground with swing set, and there was a there was a uh, a slide that was shaped like an elephant. The, yeah. You know, like the slide was his was his trunk and yeah. whatnot. And we did a lot of really fun photos. Um, Joan Jett had a T-shirt on that said "I'm a little devil," and Sherry Curry had a T-shirt on that said "I'm a little angel." <laughs> and it was, you know, very interesting. But they were, you know, they, they didn't have a clue. They were, you know. They were just, you know, not even out of high yeah, school. Right well. And But yeah. then you. Yeah, this was eight years later. And Lita at that point is trying to cut her sure, fingers in sure, metal. Sure. And, and Joan Jett was very established as a solo artist. You know, the Runaways didn't turn out to be anything, but the two of them, you know, ended up with Joan to this day. I mean, she's yeah, got a career. Joan's done really well. got her Jaguar out there, you know. Yep, yep. She's been nominated for induction. Right, um, right. Might even happen again. Um, now, and, and this was an actual shot for Cream. Cream started to branch out a bit too, correct? Right. This was for rock. This was a rock shot special shot. Yeah, yeah. for one of the special issues, the heavy metal special. Cleveland band. Yeah, Cleveland Akron. Uh, the original lineup of uh, of Devo. Anybody ever know what happened to Alan Myers, the original drummer? I I'd never heard a word about. No, him I don't know what happened. After. Um, Again, these these guys didn't do anything accidentally. Not at all. So Mark Mothersbaugh, the gentleman in the middle there, yeah. was pretty instrumental in 
any ideas for them. So when you, when you were going to work with a group like Devo, how did it come about? It wasn't just like, okay, you show up, you bring your lights, and like, there had to be some, some you know, I actually did some other sessions with them that were a lot more creative than this one. Okay. Um, he used to dress up in the Bougie Boy sure. outfit. Yeah. He used to do some really gross things where he used to put chocolate milk in his mouth, and then he would like play like he was throwing up oh, into excellent. a bucket and different things, and he was very... You know, I don't know how they worked in a still yeah. format. Yeah. No, it was a, kind of an action photo. And uh, uh, Janet McCoska, who's lurking around here somewhere, where are you? There she is. It, did, uh, it took a lot of very uh, famous photographs of this very same band. And in fact, and I should have, Janet sent a photo when she, when we were talking, uh, when she heard about this exhibit. It was a photograph that she took at Municipal Stadium of Peter Frampton on stage. And so Frampton's up there looking all, you know, golden godlike. He's got a green satin outfit on. Yeah. It's a black and white shot. Yeah. So. And then in front of this, you know, these three beefy security guys. And off to the right, there's this bearded guy with long hair taking a photograph, and it's Bob. <laughs> and so uh, it's, it's great. It's, it's a great shot because it's in the pit, shows all the production, shows the staging, shows the stadium full of people. I like yeah, that I should, shot I should have, should have put I like that, pulled that one out. It's, it's actually it's a great shot. I should have shared it with all you guys. It's the kind um, of shot that I don't normally get. You know, I'm not on the other end of the lens very often. It's funny, though, in the last couple of years, in books and things, photos have been showing up with me in them. Oh, the other photographers? Yes, there? yes. Like in the Zeppelin book, there's a couple cool shots of me and you know taking photos at Olympia oh, in January that. of uh, '75. And yeah, yeah it's, photos are starting to turn up a little bit. It's kind of neat. Rob Halford. That was taken for a cover of Cream in uh, Toronto, the beginning of their tour. Mm -hmm. I mean, Maple Leaf Gardens, backstage at Maple Leaf Gardens. When, when working with a guy like Rob Halford, who's, who essentially adopts a character, obviously not too dissimilar from his personality in a lot of ways, um, what was, when he comes in a photo section, is he saying, I want you to get me to look like this or just follow not me along? Not at all. He was like, you know, generally people were more like, what do you want me to do, really? Mm -hmm. Not very many people had their own ideas about what they wanted. It's Seriously. amazing. Yeah, well, there's well, obviously the guys in Devo. Yeah, but I'm saying generally uh, everyone else pretty much submitted to what I needed. Mm -hmm. You know, like if I tell them I'm shooting a cover or whatever and I need to place them a certain way or sure. shoot a vertical, you know, so you can put copy in or whatnot. Cool. Covers had to be shot in a special way because, you know, you had to understand where things were going to be placed. So you, you were walking into these things knowing full well that this is likely a cover shot? Oh, I, would, or, I went definitely to shoot a cover for this. This was absolutely definitely. a cover. This wasn't the actual shot that was used as the cover. But this is an outtake from that, from that session. From the same yeah. session. And, and this, this is, is a photo I believe show. that you picked out. Yes, I did. Yes, I, I like that. I yeah. like this one. Because, uh, <laughs> yeah, there, there were photos in the band that I didn't think were as, as exciting as this one. Right, right. Um, this is a, a personal favorite. Yeah, that was a fun day. This was um, this is The Clash at Hitsville, the Hitsville, USA, uh, Motown Studio A in Detroit. Uh, and because I'm a dork, I can tell you this is August 16th, 1982. <laughs> And, um, it was a Monday because I had been I had shot the police at uh, Castle Farms up in Charlotte, Michigan, the night before. So, and I hung out with him, and I didn't leave until like two o'clock in the morning because yeah. we were having such a good time. They had a barbecue outside and everything, and um, I was hungry, so I wanted to eat before I hit the road. And it took me like three hours to drive home. Got back about five five thirty in the morning. Got to sleep maybe six o'clock. Phone rang at nine o'clock in the morning. You know, I just you know just getting sleeping, and a local promoter called up and said, Hey, you know. Clash, you're going to Hitsville, they'd like you to come take pictures, yeah, yeah, whatever. And I'm like, okay, you know, and I drug down there, went to the St. Regis Hotels where all the European performers stayed. So West Grand Boulevard, which right. is just down the street from, from uh, Right, just down the street from Hitsville. From Hitsville. And uh, you know, got together with them and um, we all hopped in a in a big one of those big ten passenger Ford vans with all sure. the seats in them. Mm -hmm. And I sat up in the front with Cosmo Vinyl and we drove around Detroit and I was, you know, Give them a little tour of this is where this happened and so on and so forth. And I remember they saw a velvet peanut butter billboard <laughs> that had the three little, you know, like the you know, see no evil kind of you know, little guy with the halo hey yeah. and the guy with the devil and everything. And they thought that the was the greatest. Brand of peanut they thought butter. that was the greatest thing. Mm -hmm. And um, and we ended up here. This was the last our our final destination. Which was part of the plan. Had oh yeah, this was like out. going to Disneyland for these guys. They were so excited about going to this place. It was unbelievable. Yeah. Um, and in, in the uh, interest of full disclosure, uh, I was the guy who set this up. Um, and a couple weeks prior to this, well, a couple you, weeks prior to this, I had taken Elvis Costello on a tour of uh, the Motown Museum, which at that time was not open to the public. Right. Um, it was open to the public one day a week. One day a week. One day a week. And uh, the woman who ran it, a woman named Doris Holland, and I became friendly. And she said, "Well, if you can get anybody to come down, yeah, I'll open it up for you." So All the British I, I, guys were just crazy about Motown. They were insane music. about it, and like they they would stop their schedules to come to it. So I, I had taken Elvis Costello um, on a tour of it, and then. Um, 
in fact, I wasn't here because at this, this was, you said that was a Monday. Right. The night before, I was actually here in Cleveland, I think, for the second time right, in my you life. Can, well, seeing Elvis Costello and Talk Talk at Music Hall. And, and seeing that show. Were Talk Talk good? I used to I love them. I love them. They were yeah, great. Yeah, they were great, man. Um, we're one, like, among the few Americans who actually ever can yeah. say they saw Talk Talk. Yeah. Um, and XTC, for that matter. But yeah. anyways, we digress again. And uh, I, I was, like, I had driven back, on back to, you know, Detroit at, I don't know, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock in the morning. Similar story as mine, uh, but you got to sleep. Yeah, yeah. I got to sleep yeah. and then saw the clash and Curtis Blow that night at the, uh, at the, the Grand, Grand Circus Street. Theater. Grand Circus Theater, yeah, the only yeah. time I saw the, that band perform. Yeah. But I um, was fortunate enough to meet them two months later, and they were could not have been nicer. And then Joe, when I met him again some 15 years later, remembered me from, from that. That was a lot of fun. But as I said early on, with when we started this thing, having met, knowing who Bob was before, um, I met him, but even by this point we were friendly, sure. and uh, you know I, I certainly knew who he was. He was, as far as I was concerned, the big time. But um, I, in the interest of self-interest, I had to show this photograph. Um, this is Rock Pile. This is Howard down yeah. in the corner here. This is me right here. <laughs> and this is a photograph that ran in Cream <laughs> Magazine in 1981, and uh, this this actually right here. This is the ticket stuff from that show. Howard uh, has Rock Pile at Harpo's. Um, was this? This is. Uh, Sunday, November 16th, 1980. He's got every ticket from every concert he went to. You go in his office, he's got a little ring binder thing, and he, can, he flips through it, and he's got every ticket from That's every... That's the one that I had. But, it, but I remember when this was in Cream Magazine, knowing full well I was at the show, and looking in and like seeing myself in the corner, and then making a point <laughs> of the next time I saw Bob, it's like, hey, can I get a copy of that photo? And I finally got a copy of it, I think, last year. Yeah. yeah so... Uh, but uh, I, I, but that I had it again in the interest of, of self-interest. Um, you you shot a lot of rock and roll stuff over the years, but that's not your only interest. You shot automobiles, but uh, I want to show this. This is a really beautiful photograph that you took. Um, why don't you explain to this is folks, um, a uh, ruins at uh, the ruins of Bush Mall in uh, in the Yucatan Peninsula. Mm -hmm. um, I'm real archaeology buff of sorts and. Um, we, uh, my family and I spent several years going to Mexico and going and seeking out all the different ruins that the average tourist didn't really find. Mm -hmm. And through the years, uh, when I first started traveling as a, as a child, um, my dad and I went to all the Civil War battlefields. We went to ancient uh, Indian ruins. I um, was fortunate enough to go with him to Europe and went to, uh, went, saw Pompeii and went to different ruins and things in the Middle East and whatnot. So it's always been a great interest of mine. And this was a wonderful, uh, wonderful trip. And this is the, uh, this was known as the Magician's Pyramid. And it was supposedly, rumor had it, uh, the legend was that uh, a magician um, had a, a little elf for a friend or something, whatever, and the elf built this overnight. But actually, what the wow. thing, what the thing I was, was, still was a, I was, you know, obviously it was a tale. But the thing about all these, really? most of these, most of these ruins were built over, like these pyramids. Yeah. Generally, they were built over two or three times. Yeah. So there was a smaller structure underneath, and then they built over it again. And this one was built three times as well. It was, you know, in. Uh, but the unique thing about this particular one is it had round. It was the only one that had round edges. All the others were stepped. They were all square, all the pyramids in the Yucatan. This is the only one that had, but this was in the Puk region, which was a different artistic region, and it was a slightly different culture of people from, the, from all the other Mayans on the other side of the, uh, of the peninsula. So they developed their own the style. art was different, and their culture was a little different, and just the fact that they were separated, they learned and did things on their own. Now, it, wasn't, it was quite a while later that they merged. The background here, okay, we're not talking rock and roll, but the, you said, as you were taking this shot. Well, when we, right after we arrived there, this big storm rolled in, and this particular shot doesn't show it, but I've got other shots when I got off in the distance to the, what would have been to the right of this, up on some other buildings, this tremendous black storm came in and just produced some really, when you got away from this, this was sticking out of the jungle. All you could see was, you know, the pyramid sticking out of the yeah. jungle, and it had this black sky, and it was just very, very spectacular. It was really fun. And uh, lastly, a uh, portrait of the artist as a young man. <laughs> uh, this is taken actually. This was what was to be the Who's final party after what was to be their final tour in 1981. And they're coming oh, back too. next yeah, month. Yeah, yeah. Me too. Yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, that's right, their final tour. I went to this party, and I didn't usually get my picture taken with anybody, and I never got autographs because it wasn't professional. You know, yeah. and, you know, I'd be stooping to do that. But Pete Townsend was always a real favorite of mine, and I thought, you know what? I better, you know, like, this may be the last time I ever get to see him, kind of. And I know someone was there, a friend. Let me get a picture of you, too, because we were talking. this was shot at a restaurant in Peninsula. In Peninsula. A little Art Deco place. I don't remember. It was called the Peninsula Club. Does that still exist, anybody? Nightclub. What? 
Peninsula Nightclub. Yeah, they, they hired at Belkin Productions, who was your local promoter here, hired the place out for a private party that night, and uh, we, had a, yeah, we had a good time that night. So we're back here, and what I'd like to do now is open up the floor for questions. Uh, bef what we're going to do is have Jim, our, our, our lovely and talented volunteer, Jim Spindle, is going to come up and down. Uh, before you ask your questions, make sure you have the microphone in hand. We are recording this. It's streaming live on the web. We want people who are listening to hear it. And uh, a thousand years from now, when we're all carbon and people are researching this, they'll be able to hear your voice. So um, all the way down in front, we have, uh, we have Jack all the way down in front. Yeah, you want to start with Jack. You know, it's, it's, it's like giving Helen Thomas the first question. Ever. <laughs> Thank you. That was an excellent presentation, Mr. Alva. I really enjoy your work. My question is mostly for Howard, though, since you're involved with the induction ceremony so much. Oh, Has a photographer ever been nominated for induction? No, I mean, the thing about being inducted, and I'm speaking just from my observation, I'm not involved in the process, it's about you're inducted as a musician or performer. Yeah. Uh, the only the non-performers are generally music industry folks. Yeah. There's only been two disc jockeys or three disc jockeys right. technically inducted, uh, one booking agent, one concert promoter, you know, a lot of maybe, record business, maybe one, a songwriter. one publisher, lots of songwriters, right. some producers, some engineers. But that's, you know, it's... it's In my case, my instrument's the camera. So. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, any other questions? This gentleman here in the center. Sorry to keep you waiting for so long, sir. I know you're... With you using film, how often would you snap a picture and say, I know I had something? You know, now you just well, look you down and say, it's great or not, but how, when did you know, man, this, I had a great shot? I didn't know I had a great shot until I processed it. You know, people would ask me right after the concert, they'd see me shooting the whole concert, they'd go, wow, you got a bunch of great photos. And I'll tell you, you don't know what you got until you see them. You know, I mean, there were a lot of times when I presumed I got a great shot, and maybe it wasn't as great as I thought, and then there'd be other shots that were better than I thought they were. But uh, that was one of the things about that. I always raced back to process my film. It's like I couldn't sleep until I processed my film to know what I had. And um, I was very careful about shooting because it wasn't like with digital photography where you can just clear your card. You know, every shot had to count. And you only had so many shots in any given night. You know, it was like being in the desert with two things of water or whatever. You know, you had to be careful. So uh, I was very, you know, I was a little precise about what I did. And... Um, you know, I'd have, I'd have a couple opening acts, and I'd only be able to shoot a few shots of the opening acts because I had to save my film for the, you know, for the main act. And the crazy thing is, nowadays, you know, they only let you shoot the beginning of a show. A lot of great things happen later on in the show that, you know, that people miss now. When people are sent out from a newspaper or something to shoot a show, and they only get to shoot the first song. Mm -hmm. Well, let me tell you, the first song isn't the best song of the show, you know, so not theatrically or anything. In fact, now... They, um, they even, the lighting isn't even good intentionally in the beginning of the show for photographers so they, you know, you can't get a good photo. But um, I, was, I was careful about how I shot and um, there were times when people would jump and things would happen and you'd catch it and you'd kind of know it. And I got to the point that after I'd done it for quite a while, I was pretty confident about what I had. But you never knew what you had. You couldn't tell anybody you had a good shot until you saw it. I mean, I know you have a lot of shots. Right. You know, you have, you have a huge library of, of, of images. Right. What was just one of the best mistakes you ever caught? Just like, you had a total fluke, something that really strikes you that... Boy, I don't know, you're calling up with the best mistake. I don't know, well, I So think you had no idea, like, you looked at it later and went, oh my God, that's, that's the one I've always been looking for. Well, you know what's really funny is that a lot of times, I was always shooting close photos, and there were a lot of times where I'd go to the hall, I'd be leaving, and I'd turn around and I'd shoot like a couple, there'd be a couple frames left on the roll. Yeah. And I'd be leaving or something, and so I'd be walking away and I'd turn around and I'd shoot a show from a distance. And I think a lot of times the show shots that I did from a distance or something that weren't something that were calculated after the fact, and even in later years of us editing and looking for photos, there were a lot of shots that weren't important shots to me when I took them that are a lot more important now you know, simply because of, you know, just different angles, different aspects. Um, yeah, we, um, Eric's here, and he does a lot of, uh, Eric Nordbeck, he does a lot of editing. He's put my whole archive back together for me, and uh, it's amazing the photos that, going through photos that didn't make the original cut. Mm -hmm. And um, Well, we, and, we found that when we were doing this. There were a right, couple of things that right. you and I had differences of opinion. And I used to shoot slide film, and I used to have to mount it myself. So with shooting so many shows a week, I would go through and pull just the best shots out, mount those, get those to the magazine, and be shooting more stuff. So I couldn't work with everything. So yeah. some things got put in envelopes, some things got filed without being used. And now that we've gone back and looked at them, there are a lot of things that are really valuable to us yeah. that at the time weren't valuable at all. 
And um, you know, that's what, you know, we found a lot of that stuff. And we put the archive all back together, okay. a lot of it the way it was shot. Great. And um, I'm really glad to have it back together the way it is now. Any more questions? Uh, all the way in the back there. I'm interested in some of the technical things you had to deal with having done photography for a long time. I can relate to using black and white film. Of course, we had the advantage of fast film, tri-X, and pushing film. Sure. But when we started shooting slide film, it was a totally different game because the exposure latitude was so critical. You had to be right on. I'm s interested in what films you were using because if my memory served me correctly, I think when Ektachrome 200 came out, it was a big deal. And your exposures in metering on those concert shots because the lighting is so spotty. How did you handle that and how did you approach it? You know, that's, it's, it's true that um, the emulsions, uh, you know, fast film didn't come about. Uh, 200 Ektachrome came out in 77. It wasn't until like the early, early 80s that 400 ASA came out. And um, I shot slide film, which was slower ASA. And I tried to shoot Kodachrome whenever I could. Kodachrome was the best film that was ever created. And it just ended a year ago. A uh, year ago, December, the last roll was processed. So you can't get, I've still got some rolls of Kodachrome, but I have nowhere to get them processed. But uh, they're, they're unexposed, so it doesn't matter. But um, yes, uh, slow film with, uh, and so many of the, the actual concert photos, I tried not to use flash if I didn't have to. It got to the point to where I used it a little more to fill. But um, I tried to use fast lenses, prime lenses. Um, all my lenses were, you know, one fours or no more than two eights. Um, Canon actually came out with fast lenses before Nikon did. Canon had a 200-2.8 before Nikon, and I had an 85-1.8 and some various. So I was using fast prime lenses, fast apertures, meaning that the camera had a larger hole to allow the light. So you guys got that down, right? Oh, yeah. Just want to make sure we're all in the same. So, you know, it had a lot to do with lenses, and, um, and you had to, you know, you had to kind of take a breath when you were, you know, squeezing the shutter on some of these sure. things. The uh, shot of uh, Mick Jagger that I took, the Mick Jagger jump shot, that was shot with Kodachrome 64, at 60th of a second with no flash. That's almost impossible that that photo would have turned out that way. And, but it was and, just and that photo is actually on the text panel in the, yeah, in the yeah. Uh, um, yeah, so exhibit. it's just, I mean, normally you wouldn't have been able to do that with, you know, with that. So. Okay. Do you have a spot meter, a handheld spot I used a spot once in a while. The Canon F1 had a pretty good built-in meter, but we had to set everything manually. And I used to bracket a lot. And using all the artificial light, um, you didn't have to be right on because it wasn't like you were shooting in daylight and you had to have true 5,000 Kelvin. All those different color lights were, you know, mixing and blending and whatnot. So, um, but I'd have to use, I'd shoot at 60th, 125th of a second, but I'd try to use the fastest lenses that I could. And um, using the slower ASA films just, I mean, if you see the color in the pictures in the gallery, it's all about Kodachrome. You couldn't have done that, you know, on Ektachrome or on faster. It would have been grainy and whatnot. And I used to carry... Um, I did a lot of sessions on location where I took canvases and paper out and strobe systems and gels and whatnot. I was a little more of a technician than the average entertainment photographer. I was more of a photo student and I was into all that kind of technical stuff. And it got to the point to where um, people told me that when they started to look in magazines and they saw backlit photos and whatnot, they could tell that they were mine without looking at the photo credit. because It was kind of a style that I started to develop. And I think that's one of the reasons why they actually picked my stuff. Yeah, I, I've always found that there, there's, there's, there, there's an interesting lighting thing that goes on with Bob's photos. And hopefully you'll see how they, they pop in the gallery. Um, there was another question over, actually, too. Um, gentlemen, uh, yeah, to my right. Uh, besides the fact that processing Kodachrome was poisonous as anything. Oh, it's terrible. Uh, yeah. Do you always use uh, um, umbrellas when you shoot your studio stuff? I used to shoot through an umbrella sometimes, use it as a soft box. Um, but yeah, I'd use different types of diffusers, you know, to soften up the light. You could shoot through, you know, shoot through you know, any type of baffling thing. But people used to shoot out of reflectors where they shoot a reflector and let the light come out of the reflector. I used to take the umbrella and shoot through it because it would break down, it would, you'd get less light and it wasn't quite as harsh. And I was shooting in a lot of short distances. If I was shooting in a dressing room or a hotel room or Backstage, I didn't have a lot of distance, so I was pretty close proximity. So if you're using a big strobe system and you're only 10 feet, got your lights 10 feet from the subject, you'd, you know, you'd blast them right out of the place. So I had to do what I could to kind of block the light a little bit, actually. Uh, actually, I used Novatron, and I had um, white lightnings. And, um, but my Novatron system, my small one, I took around a lot. I didn't take a big system around. Uh, this gentleman here on the end of the, that row. 
Uh, thanks a lot. It's very interesting to hear a photographer speak about this topic. Uh, but so if you're, uh, you were at the Ridgefield Coliseum in 1977, and there's Led Zeppelin. Um, it's, it seems a little strange to me that someone could sell the pictures um, without compensating the, the band, you know? No, it was all about publicity. Uh -huh. um, you know, I was there to take photos, and they were going to get published in a magazine. It was going to just further someone's career. You know, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't merchandise. We weren't selling T-shirts. You know, it was, you know, it had to do with publicity. And, and the, today, the, today, if you have those photographs, and pe I'm sure there's a lot of interest in those photographs, uh, you own the photographs, right? right. Yeah, so he owns a copyright. He created the work. And as, right. fine That's art, as fine art, I can sell them. As long as I sell them in a finite amount, if I sell less than 500 units of anything, it's fine art. As long as I sign it and number it, it's fine art. If you print it on a printing press and you start printing a thousand Mask, copies yeah. of something as a poster, now you're merchant. But the other, the other thing is the, the, the industry, as it were, was much, much smaller then. And there were known quantities throughout it. You know, he's, he's a professional photographer shooting for established magazines. And in other parts of the country, there were guys like Bob who were doing similar thing with, you know, Paul Natkin, as I mentioned, in Chicago. Chicago uh, sure. There were guys in L.A. Bob in New York. Yeah, Bob Lozar in L.A. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there were guys like that all over the country. And, I mean, some of them are better known than others, like Jim, the late Jim Marshall. Obviously, Jim was shooting mostly in, in San Francisco, but the photographers, through the copyright laws, own their images. They are the copyright holder, and they're allowed to, again, exploit their catalog for, like, whether it's for uh, editorial or what, you know, publication. Right. Um, that's why you know, DVDs, agencies, any kind of CD reissues, yeah, box sets. That's how guys can make his living, and, and it's great. Nowadays, they don't have that luxury because, so, you know, a photographer walks into a, a show from, you know, whatever pop star right. called One Direction. I mean, right. the publicist makes you sign an agreement right. that makes you give over, so surrender all your copyright. Photos when you take them. Yeah, they're not yours. And that's essentially killed their business. Uh, but, you know, if the artists want to kill their business, you know, the record companies kill the artists. So what the hell? You know, it's, it's, yeah. just, it's a never descending spiral. The Internet's also a very difficult thing because once an image is digital, right. it's, there's no control over it right. at all. So they, they just don't disappear. So, so guys like you know, Bob or Janet who, who can control their yeah, own. Yeah, people won't have the opportunity to do this in the future. Yeah, they, they, they have it's already over with stuff. Them. Exactly. It is, it is already over with. But they, they own the images that they can you know, sell to whomever they want to. But if you find yourself at a concert today and you happen to get a great picture of someone, uh, you know, I mean, y no one's stopping you from selling that picture, are they? Uh -huh. If you're... Yeah, it's really, it's, it's amazing. Now, like if you shoot Britney Spears or someone of that nature, um, you literally have to take your camera to them, like at the event. You know, we were just told this. In fact, Janet and I were talking about this. Um, they're, they huddle all the photographers together after they shoot a show. They take them in a room, and they have access to their photos right then. And they have, some people delete photos on photographers' cameras that they don't like. Right at, right at the instant. So it's, very, it's, it's all yeah, The amount of publicist control and artist control really is, is, <laughs> is absurd, or performer control, not artist control, performer right. control. But if you were to go and shoot you know, a cheap trick show now, and it's, you know, you're shooting, you're going to sell a photo if you feel it's not going to, they're gonna, not going to feel like they're exploited because right. you have a relationship you're right, going to maintain, right. correct? It's different for me than someone else, too. I mean, like you said, if you're established doing it or whatever, people expect and know that it's, you know, that it's going to happen. They're not shocked if someone sees me, you know. Yeah. They, they, that's how he and Janet and other great photographers established their reputation by not screwing over their subjects. Right. And people, you know, trust you. You know, when, you know, I have photos that I've taken out on the road. I've got photos that I've never sold, you know, that I could. But it's something that someone wouldn't appreciate being seen. So you know, yeah. So yeah, as long as you're, you know. I mean, that, the photo we showed of uh, Bon Scott. Uh, but the, have you ever published that one? Is that ever? No, oh. no. But I've got other World shots exclusive. from that particular couple weeks with ACDC and different things that I've got. Yeah. I can only imagine. Yeah. Uh, any, any I was doing a photo ahead. session with ACDC once, and Angus just dropped his pants to the floor. You know, so you can't. You know, I, I'm not interested in selling those photos anymore. Yeah. Um, this woman right here, dead center. <coughs> No, we got to document this. I, I, it's okay with me if you yell, but they yell at me if I don't make sure you get the mic. Hi there. Um, you talked a lot about the perf uh, artists that you enjoyed working with. Can you share some stories about those who were challenging to work with? Huh. Um, we t I've 
been asked a lot of times who was the worst person that I worked with or who was my favorite, and I've always... It's me. <laughs> I've, um, I, I think probably Morris Day was probably the rudest person that I ever worked with in a sense that he just was very aloof and while I was doing the session with him he wasn't paying attention to me and he was talking to someone else and when I got close to him he told me to back off not to get his freckles and all this stuff and everything and he very he was very much like the character that he played in the Purple Rain movie that was truly his personality and I know when, when Twisted Sister were big um, a couple of the guys were kind of rude in the band they didn't handle most people handled success pretty, you know, handled success pretty well, but those guys were a little overwhelmed by it, I think. And, but generally speaking, everybody was great to me. Everybody was very nice because they knew I was there, you know, to help them. So they were, you know, they were always, you know, I was on their side, you know, as part of the team or whatever. So everyone was very nice to me. Anything else? Well, I want to thank you all for uh, taking time out of your lives to uh, to uh, come be part of this program. And once again, uh, the show, Robert Alford, I just can't get enough, the photography of Robert, Al Robert Alford, him, will be here uh, until, I believe, May of next year. In, it's going to be a long-running long show, folks. Two full cycles, yeah. Yeah, uh, so please, we actually, the museum doesn't close for another half an hour. It's time for you to go downstairs and check it out. Um, thanks again for coming. And thank you, Robert Alford. Thank you. Thanks to the folks at home who tuned in on the internet. Right.